It's inevitable. We discussed that with yesterday to, see, to give you some general perspectives before going into a more specific or a few specifics, excuse me. It's really inevitable that we come to these topics with our own sight bedingt uh, condition to our time, background, our perspectives, even baggage. Uh, this should not be dismissed as pure relativism. It's actually a healthy thing that we, and by we I mean observers and scholars from ancient times to modern, can look at these phenomena in different ways. One underlying reason, specifically with reference to the time we're discussing, is that any Augustan phenomenon, whether it's art, literature, social history, religion, it has more than one dimension. Specifically, uh, <coughs> It has more than I mentioned, even Tacitus recognized that in his famous judgment for us is in Annales 19, 110, where he gives the two sides. I mean, he realizes this is not a one dimensional situation at all. Another factor, one that has been well reinforced in the recent memory studies, is a commonplace that we often and sometimes too often view the past in terms of the present. Put all these factors together, and the result is an interesting dynamic when we try to assess the role of Augustan literature in the political context of its time. Further, and this is my final preparatory point, that these assessments, so far from being static, have been an ongoing process. And to me, again, that's a positive aspect, because that is only fitting for the Augustan age, which exhibits the same characteristics, far from being a golden age reborn, uh, that began the morning after the Battle of Actium. It was a continuing work in progress. And I think that's a major reason for its vitality. And the writers were part of that process. They responded to the new phenomenon in varied ways. There was no uniformity whatsoever, and participated in shaping it. I might have contrast and to provide some uh, uh, signposts for our discussion. Let me briefly comment on the more static view which dominated the discussion of this topic for quite some time. That was, of course, uh, the, the, uh, the view that the Augustan writers were simply singing the praises of the new order and extolling the Julian regime. Tiberius Claudius Donatus, late 4th century, early 5th century, offers a succinct formulation as he sets out the raison d'etre for Virgil's Aeneid. And you have it right there. It was really that Virgil's task was to present Aeneas in such a way that he might prove to be a worthy count and ancestor of Augustus, in whose honor the Aeneid was written. And this view, of course, was also there of the English and French Augustans. It was reinforced, even if polemically, by 20th century grandees, writers, such as Robert Graves, who did not like Virgil, titled his, his article The Virgil Cult. And yet more influentially, Robert Sign, who used it with broad brush and sharp pen, for Augustan poets such as Virgil and Horace in his chapter of the Roman Revolution, that he entitled the organization of opinion. The similar was simple. Uh, the poets were simply mouthpieces of the regime. Albert, by contrast, was a, quote, disgrace and had to go. And they were propagandists. Now, Sign made it very clear that he wrote his book in the context of his times, in the late 1930s. That is specifically the time of the European dictators who, like Augustus, whom Sainte projected as their godfather, had seized power by various kinds of force. The concept of centrally steered propaganda therefore resonated. It heavily affected, to give but one example outside of literature, the view of Roman coins that is still being debated today. The major Roman, uh, the major catalogs of Roman coins of the British Museum were published at the time and Augustan coins in particular were quickly viewed as a means of propaganda. To return to Augustan literature, after science characterization and Mussolini's appropriation, especially of Virgil, uh, of Virgil's national, national epic, scholars who took a favorable view of Virgil and Horace aimed to rescue them uh, by showing that they were really not sympathetic to the Augustan regime. The search then was on for ambiguities, which are always easy to find, and, and given the multivalence of Latin words, and with an emphasis on subversive meanings. The end of the Aeneid became a primary exhibit. The Aeneas were shown to succumb to Juno-like fury and anger, and therefore, as Michael Putnam put it in 1963, and time and again after that, uh, he said, according to the poet's wishes, I quote, it is she, the vengeful Juno, uh, 
not Aeneas, nor the grandeur for which Augustus seems to stand, who wins the greatest victory in the end. This argument with various elaborations is that they have to dominate the discussion for several decades, especially in America. Note the, uh, the collocation again, the conflation of the grandeur of Augustus with the behavioral vicissitudes of Aeneas. The reductive traditional schema of Tiberius Claudius Donatus does not discard it, but simply turn upside down. The lesson to be learned here, in my opinion, is precisely this. To make progress in scholarship, it is not enough for us simply to react against the dominant interpretation by turning thesis into antithesis. That way, you never leave the box. Uh, to some extent, that is the downside of beginning a research seminars at the graduate level with a lengthy Wissenschaftsbericht. Of course, one has to be familiar with the previous scholarship, but which should not be limited to its confines. In this case, therefore, instead of staking out some further territory, if that, within dichotomizing parameters such as pro Augustan, anti Augustan, it is more useful to go back to the time of creation, so to speak, and to look at the actual historical context of the Augustan writers and the issues to which they both responded and whose discussions they shaped. A major theme clearly is coping with the past, but embarking on a future that was not nearly as certain at the time as it looks to us in retrospect. A cardinal example is the Aeneid, and I cannot emphasize strongly enough that it was not the target, product of a beautifully tidy and solidified golden age reborn, but it was written in the 20s, when there were still plenty of uncertainties, anxieties, <coughs> afflictions, and purely material crises, along with the appreciation of incipient stability. How would Augustus rule? But if anything happened to him, and he almost died in 23, uh, was this really going to be the end of the civil wars with more than half a million soldiers who fight, have been fighting civil wars still hanging around? Uh, there were still food shortages, inundations of the Tiber. The Parthians were knocking on the door in the east. Here, in short, is one reason for the many voices <laughs> that have been discerned in the epic, and we can revisit that topic in the discussion. Its major, the, the major tone register of the epic is not triumphalism, but ongoing effort and cautious hope. Methodologically, of course, it is a truism that any great work of literature will elicit different responses and thereby ensure its vitality. Any great work of literature's polysemus has many layers. One problem with the interpretation, especially of Augustan poetry, is that this multi layeredness. The German Vielschichtigkeit, which is really a much more precise term than ambiguity, has been interpreted too narrowly through a political lens, as if the poets were trying to make a political statement at every juncture, with Augustus being the only reader, reference point, or target. Instead, the horizon was wider, and here it's useful again to bring in the methodology of Hans Robert Jaus. Conversely, it was not Augustus alone who would think about the pressing issues of the time and then force their literary expression into a straitjacket. What happened to Rome, what had brought it so close to ruin, was the subject of discussion for the educated classes as well as the non-elites, though, as usual, we have virtually no literary testimony from the latter. What had caused the afflictions visited upon Rome? The literature is full of different answers and perspectives. Here is your national conversation rather than a state-imposed view. The opinions range, you can look at the, uh, at the samples in the, in the handout here. The opinions range from Livy's preface with his poignant formulations about the lapse of mores, the irremediable vitia, to Virgil's conjuring up the original sin of the perjury of Laomedon, the fratricide of Romulus, to purposes haunting evocations of the Pulvis Etrusca, Funa Italiae, and Paul 122. Horace offers his own technique. Uh, combining moral elements like Livy's in Odes 36 and 324, uh, and Romulus and Remus as the original sin in that Odes 7, while he has Juno in Odes 33 relegate the fraud of Laomedon to the Trojan past, but then will not have another iteration in Rome. And as usual, there is no consistency. At other times, Horace invokes Romulus unencumbered by his human past, in his divine incarnation as Quirinus. So it's 3, 5, 3, 5, 15 to 16. He is not the mortal, but the immortal ancestor of Augustus, and his misdeeds are thereby alighted. 
Another instance of this, of course, is an old one too. You have some excerpts from that from the handout. I want to use it both in its own right and as a microcosm of my argument that a national conversation or discussion took place. How did Octavian become Augustus? A major alternative, as both Suetonius and Dio attest, was that Octavian strongly considered calling himself Romulus. But then he gave up on the idea because of the obvious implications of affectatio regni, which is not a good thing to have in Rome. Uh, and uh, also, the alternative version of Romulus' death at the hand of the senators. It's not that Romulus that went straight to heaven, there is the other version too. That he, the reason for his disappearance was that the senators kind of ganged up on him, and that's why he disappeared. And so, therefore, he opted, uh, Octavian opted for Augustus instead, a name whose transcending aura was both richer and not weighed down by some negative <coughs> conditions. Now, clearly, these decisions were not made just a few weeks before the Senate meeting in 27 BC, the so called First Settlement, which was the first step toward the definition of the Augustan principle. Instead, all the issues that were brought up there had really been discussed for several years, uh, and, and was just the, the first step toward the definition of the Augustan principle. Uh, the uh, contemporary witnesses of that, that, that this kind of background discussion for Christ, uh, is a debate between Mycenaeus and Agrippa in Book 52 of Dio, and also the, when it comes to coins, the uh, recent uh, aureus published by John Rich, in fact, of Birmingham, uh, that has the inscription, Leges et Jura Restituit, and that is a year or two before actually 22nd. So you can see this, uh, this is an ongoing discussion that is taking place, all kinds of people are participating in it. But if we turn to Horace in the old one too, he goes over the various possibilities of divine assimilation for Octavian. To what God, Horace asks, will Jupiter give the task of expiating the scabbers of the civil wars? He mentions several, only to end with Octavian and wishing for him to remain for a long time among the people of Prolinus. Here, then, we have much more than just an intertextual illusion. In that we can discuss that, hopefully, we can discuss that too. I think you know, intertext has become just too easy a. a uh, an interpretive uh, you know, schema to operate. I mean, it, it just sounds so good, doesn't it? And you're so smart to discover that the intertext, but uh, it doesn't go particularly deep at times, I've got to tell you. But anyway, uh, the, uh, it's, it's more than the textual allusion to Virgil's prayer at the end of the first Georgic, uh, that on the handout too, especially as far as goes on to call Octavian pater after Trapex. Now, again, the most likely date for this old is a year or two before 27. When these terms, which will become official later, Stadius and Trinkeps, Sigmund's Pater Patria, and 2 BC, they are already being discussed, and clearly Horace is reflecting and drawing, participating in that discussion. The same is true, I would argue, of Horace's treating Octavian already as a divus, Zerus in Cairo Reyes. Yeah, that only on the handout, that's line 45 and 1 2. This is not the only instance where he wrote of an author to do so. Consider Augustus already as Divus, and as Lisbon and Hubbard, their commentary to judiciously point out, this is not just poetic license or object flattery. Instead, it reflects, to quote Lisbon and Hubbard, what was going on in the real world. End of quote. True enough, Augustus never allowed his cultic worship within the city of Rome, and it is only after 27 that we see the imperial cult spring up in various configurations in Italy and only as far as Austria and the provinces. But again, the matter had clearly been under discussion for years. It was a matter of a national conversation. It was part of a national conversation, and this is where Horace is coming from. These ends could be multiplied, and they vary from court to court, but let me turn to the very issue of the political interpretation of Augustan poetry. I can be relatively brief here, uh, because here the work of Peter White, who is a colleague of is absolutely fundamental. Uh, it's the book Promised Verse, uh, Poets in the Society of Augustine Rome, at that at the end of the handout, 1993. As he has shown, the roots of the political interpretation, such as it is, of the Augustine poetry, had its roots in the treatise of the epic poem, in six volumes, quite a treatise, of the French abbe René Le Bourseau who lived at the time of Louis XIV. 
Its main subject was la politique, the instruction politique, uh, which he used largely in a sense. Think of Aristotle's zone politicon of civil or moral. Or White, he never uses the word with reference to political programs or to practical issues of government and of public. When the work was translated in English, however, politique took on a different meaning. Amid the political controversies there, in which many prominent uh, writers in England were involved, it now meant political partisanship and advocating a political program. By the time of John Dryden's epochal translation of the Aeneid in 1697 and the dedicatory essay that accompanied it, the view had been articulated first as reference to the Georgics that, to quote Dryden, an Augustan poem was propagating a government inspired message about a practical issue of policy. From there, it was via libera applying this approach to other poems. A hugely influential figure was Henri Patin, the professor of Latin poetry at the Sorbonne in the early 19th century. He sweepingly argued that all poetry under Fernando Augustus had to be interpreted as political because Augustus had co opted the poets. And it took only a few decades for this view to be accepted into the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Teufel's authoritative history of Roman literature, and ultimately by Ronald Sign. It is, to be sure, too simplistic and reductive a view when it has basically been discarded. It depends, of course, on the semantics of political we were discussing a little bit yesterday. And here we can go back to the Aristotelian pre dryden meanings of the word as denoting civic engagement. That is certainly the case with the Augustan writers. Their writings are anything but disengaged from the issues of the day without being the project of political partisanship, even some of them were amici of Augustus. I will come back to these perspectives shortly, but first let me take up one related modern concept which has been applied to Augustine's thematics, and that is ideology. War during the French Revolution, used polemically by Napoleon against the Parisian group who called themselves les ideologues, and elaborated greatly by Foucault on modern political theory, ideology has become a frequently used term of convenience for anything that encompasses a stated set of beliefs held by individuals, groups, governments, in this more loose kind of definition, it certainly would fit the rule of Augustus. At the same time, the term today has acquired connotations that are, depending on your point of view, either more precise or more restrictive. Uh, they include the imposition of normative behavior, inflexibility, insistence on sole ownership of truth, a certain narrowness of vision, identity thinking, I think Dustin Terry Eagleton just written on that, and systematic theorizing. As in the case of political, therefore, it depends on the place we want to choose a semantic spectrum. I have been, speaking for myself, I have been averse to using ideology as a broad common denominator of Augustus' actions because he was not an ideologue in the modern sense of the word. It would be inaccurate to have him lumped together with modern ideologues both on the left and the right. In contrast to them, he displayed more pragmatism, flexibility, <coughs> willingness to experiment. And of course, he had a set of values to guide him, but these values are not just his alone. They articulated, for instance, in Livy's preface, you can go back to that in the end of again. He speaks of setting a monument to the mores and the lives of the men by whose artes in civil and military life the imperium was created. <coughs> Excuse me, I think priest. Two quick observations. One, in his famously succinct summary of the Roman national character, uh, Virgil uses the same terminology to regular imperio populos, high tibarum artes. It's really almost the same as in Libby. Another specific example, then, of the dialogue, the conversation that took place. In addition, as Norton has noted, de bellare in the next line, uh, Virgil uses it for the only time, but that, that point in the Aeneid is a favorite word used by Libby. Unless we think it was only a matter of following the Augustan line, one of many instances of Livy's independence was his divergence from Augustus' choices when it came to memorializing these great Romans, these Sunni Viri, in the form of Augustus. As James Lewis, and you have that reference at the end of the handout, has demonstrated there are numerous disagreements between the elogia uh, in the form of Augustan and the information emphasis found in Livy. In so many words. We are looking at a situation of shared and debated overall values, but different perspectives, 
and obliterate expressions. That is not surprising unless we start from the premise of Gleichschaltung. So far from being uniform or one-dimensional, the material the material dividers we're dealing with, including Augustus himself, had multiple dimensions that prompted multiple responses and literary treatments. I want to conclude by briefly uh, highlighting one such aspect, each for Virgil, Horace, and Ovid, and then pose a final question. My basic argument is this. Just as with Livy's history, if Augustus himself had written the Aeneid, Horace's Aulus, and Ovid's Metamorphoses, there would have been different works, and not just in terms of quality. Uh, a central consideration for the Aeneid is that Virgil had alternatives. He did not have to write an Aeneid. On the basis of the Roman epic tradition and the poem to the third Georgic, the expectation was that he would write an epic about Augustus. The subject would have been the culmination of Roman history with a few flashbacks. To the Trojan ancestor, the tone would perforce have been more triumphalist and panegyrical, and the epic's ethos would have been quite different. Instead, Virgil reversed the procedure. We are looking at Rome from the perspective of the first ancestor. Rome is not even founded in the idea. The story and achievement of Rome are a constant work in progress, as is the reconstruction of Roman cultural memory that goes with it, and so on. Augustus appears three times. The rest of the epic is about the huge effort, tan time modus, tan time modus that really would take to found the, the, the Roman nation. Is this any less Augustine? Not at all. We can go to the Sumi Viri on the former Augustine again. This time for convergence, Augustus deliberately set up some bases for statues of future Sumi Viri that were to be set up later. Uh, and we know that this actually was done. They were set up in bonds. He simply wanted to indicate we are not done yet. This is an ongoing process you know, right here. Nothing triumphal is about it. Further, Virgil universalized the Roman Augustan experience into a paradigm of the human experience in general. A traditional military epic of all Augustus would never have reached that level. But of course, such an epic would have been somewhat problematic. Uh, given the excesses of the triumph for it, and what was essentially a civil war against Antony. The only baggage Aeneas has to carry was his father. Octavian had a lot more. As for Horace, his lyric poetry in particular exemplifies that it would be wrong to overemphasize the political dimension of his relationship with Augustus. Sure, there are always a deal with Augustus, 1-2, 1 112, 415, so-called Roman Odes, um, 3, 1 6, that address various Roman values. The vast majority of the odes, however, are occasional poetry on subjects such as friendship, wine, love, change of seasons, equanimity, certainty of death, and so on. Much of it is what I would call lifestyle poetry, uh, a subject that is open, nothing in excess, and of course, whether immortality figure prominently. Old 329 is a paradigm with this invitation to Mycenaeus to take a respite from the world of state fair. Join Horace and Tibor, and the Carpe, the Carpe Dia motif is central to the poem. And it must not be a poetry. We know from correspondence between Augustus and Horace, reported by Suetonius, that Augustus wanted to make Horace as his, his private secretary. Horace suffered no harm when he refused. And the bantering tone of Augustus' communications continued as per Suetonius' veto of Horace. Here is one of the strongest bases for Peter White's reassessment of the relationship between Augustus and the poets in terms of amicitia, friendship. And the Roman context is promoted more than just socializing. Think of the very official procedure laid on the Tiberius of amicitia and renuntiare, uh, and uh, you know, sending people out there. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> but it's, it's still quite different from political partisanship. Besides, in historical and socio-economic terms, I mean, I mean, here is much more, it's a much more accurate concept than another anachronistic import of the Roman milieu that is patronage, I won't discuss here. Finally, what about Arden? Isn't he the prime exhibit of a power to writer being punished for ideological differences with a political leader? In this case, again, we are dealing with the import of later notions into the Augustan milieu. Paradoxically, certainly in view of his highly modern construction as an ideological dissenter, Ovid in many ways is the truest product of the Augustan age proper. 
born a generation after the others, he celebrates mm. that time without being encumbered by the memory of the turmoil and the chaos that preceded it. Uh, he is sometimes, even more than the, the, the other poets in Libby, the ideal spectator, mm. to borrow a term from Greek drama. He is the only one in that group whose life was coextensive <laughs> with the entire reign of Augustus. Uh, what was the central aspect of that reign? Change. Change. In an incredible number of ways. All of the provinces, art and architecture, religion, government, much more than government. I can refer you to Andrew Wallace Hamble's concept of the Augustan Cultural Revolution. Hence the title of Ovid's masterwork, Metamorphosis. Today, in the hindsight of some 2,000 years, we can delineate the changes that took place in the Augustan world, in its society and culture, more clearly, but most Romans at the time realized that change was taking place, not simply a return to the past, but a departure into an often uncharted future. And most of his poetic production, especially in the hours of Matoya, the Metamorphosis, the Fasti, all it engages astutely with significant themes and issues of his time. Clearly, he's a free spirit. Did that lead to his exile? The two reasons he famously cites, in case we have nothing else to discuss, we can always discuss all his exile. <laughs> uh, the two reasons he famously cites are Carmen and Error, with the former, with the former being, as Ovid himself made clear, a pretext that is the Ars that has been published several years earlier, in current terminology, that's fake news. As for the Error, Ovid, who was never at the loss for words, is totally and uncharacteristically quiet about it. And that indicates that was a real issue. Probably a transgression with some member of the Augustan family. The final question remains, would there have been a similar kind of literary efflorescence and creativity without the phenomenon of Augustus and the ideas and topics that it generated? <coughs> possibly, possibly, but not in the same way. We can draw a parallel here to 5th century Athens, and Augustine owned many rights uh, back to 5th century Athens. The existential threat of the Persian invasions, the successful struggle against them, the ensuing period of stability, followed by renewed crises, caused the intense reflection on and discussion of basic values and identity that we see in the Athenian tragedy, which came up in you know, several comedy too, came up in several of the papers in the past two days. Uh, and uh, uh, also in, in, in Athenian architecture. The same applies to Augustine Rome after a long period of civil wars that brought Rome to the brink of self-destruction and caused searching questions about traditions and identity. As in Athens, stability returned, but it could not be taken for granted by the generation of Virgil, Horace, and Libby. But their reactions and those of Ovid and others, such as the Elidus, showers that, and again, it's in a way similar to 5th century Athens, their process of framing literal responses was autonomous, parallel to what Paul Sanko has fundamentally established for Augustine art, Augustus and the Power of Images, 1987, 89, 88. It was not the result of top-down ideology or propaganda, but the possible reciprocity and a variety of reactions and responses. The topics, including Augustus himself, were rich and multi-layered, and their corresponding treatment by the writers is what made the Augustan age a high point in world literature. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we can start putting questions to this president. I'm here for That's what I'm here for, I said, please. That's great. Yeah. I'll hold back. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I'm Jan Kahn, from the Great Friend of Truvius. Could you put this, my, my great friend Vitruvius in context with this? Because there is an alternative interpretation of Vitruvius of being not the rule maker, but one of almost completely evades total systematic definition of architecture. And it seems to be, he fits much more better with this interpretation of an ongoing process. Yeah, but again, I'm glad you bring that up. I think really, in terms of being an Osario Vitruvius, I really, uh, I, I, I easily defer to you, but I mean, the, the point is exactly the one you made. They pick out 
speak at the time, you give out a few sentences in the preface about the authoritas of buildings and the Augustus authoritas, and immediately some kind of party line or whatnot is established. It is far more, and then, then Vitruvius appears as a kind of conventional, a strict constructionist, you might say, of the, uh, you know, the architectural orders. There is a great deal more, uh, obviously, to him in terms of, uh, you know, just to expand on that a little bit, in terms of uh, uh, having his own creative bent. And uh, in fact, I mean, the, the situation generally is this, he seems to be trying to persuade his client, as, archi as architects do, you know, obviously, he's not the first one, uh, to persuade his client that is, you know, take and smash Augustus to look at certain things. It's not the other way around that Augustus says, now, you know, once you build this kind of thing and, and so on and so forth. I mean, yeah, thank God, I've got to say, he has not been dragged into the black end of the horse. <laughs> That, that, kind of, that kind of simplistic, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm serious about that. That kind of simplistic construction of the Augustan culture in the Europe. Uh, they, they realize, that it's, especially when he talks about this at the beginning, and the preface too about the, the architect, but he should be a liberal arts major, and you know, that sort of thing, not to say technician. I mean, they simply, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up, there's simply a lot more to him than a uh, kind of pedestrian, you know, just uh, go by the book. Kind of dentist uh, uh, of the Augustan age in that sense. You want to, I mean, you want to just, just comment on that? Yeah, oh. I mean, I, what can you do with the punches and the details? Excuse me, I have no such a mighty memory as uh, Nikolai has. So, uh, in this um, the session, uh, I, now I'll ask uh, Nikolai to summarize your question and answer. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, later, yeah, yeah, yeah. and later, okay. please speak short, okay. speak well, short and, well, and I'll translate. You want to, you want to translate the Russian into this? Yeah, I'll summarize it. I'll translate it later. Вопрос касался того, как можно в эту систему картину, которую представляет профессор Галинский, вписать Витрувия, который тоже гораздо более, с точки зрения профессора Фуэ, сложный автор, чем его обычно представляют. Профессор Галинский совершенно согласен с этим и говорит о том, что обычно интерпретирует позицию Витрувия, в том числе и в политическом смысле, и следователи вытягивают, выбирают из предисловия несколько фраз и представляют Витрувия действующим почти по заказу э, власти. Хотя в действительности картина совершенно обратная, э, а именно Петрувий, как архитектор, он вообще-то занимается той задачей, что э, убеждает своего клиента в том, что э, это надо взять. В клиентов в данном случае выступает август. И, э, поэтому в действительности скорее Петрувий э, отчасти конвенционально убеждает э, в том, что, с одной стороны, архитектура гораздо больше, чем архитектура, и важна для государства тоже, но и, кстати, это гораздо более сложный автор, в том числе и потому, и литературный автор, что говорит, что архитектор обязательно должен закончить полный курс свободных источников. Yes. I highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I've, I've seen, seen the film. You've seen the film. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that's right. And uh, and you you actually translated far more. Of, you know what I said. What <laughs> <laughs> happens in the movie where it's, where it's condensed into two lines, and he says, "Is that all you said?" You know, I think. Oh, I think you've done a very good job talking about translation. Thank you, Michael, for translating my easy English prose into fluent Russian. Mm -hmm. Okay, questions. Next question. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I have a minor question concerning my point, but maybe with some more implications. You said that Virgil uh, didn't have to write in it. I'm actually not sure about that. I, I think that he had to, uh, to write in it because, uh, you know, one of the points is now from politics to literacy itself, at plan to politics. You know, we have one crucial idea of the age is to uh, create literature compared or, uh, or even better than the Greeks had. Uh, and actually, uh, they lack Homer in a sense. They do have Phineas, of course, but it's 
historically. So, so basically, they need Homer, and you remember, of course, the famous Protestant words, or uh, we are waiting for something greater than, than Iliad. So, and then going back to politics, I think that all you said about uh, the multi-layerness of uh, the of that's absolutely right. But the idea is the main ideology, if you wish, yeah, is yeah. to have a big, uh, great state uh, uh, should have great literature. Uh, so we do need in it, not even the epic about uh, uh, Augustus, but something compared to Homer, our uh, beginnings. Okay. In order to that, we need in it. Nikolai, who is we? Uh, well, Augustus. Augustus and, uh, That's it. Okay. The royal we. He just said, I want, I want an Aeneid written. That's it. Yeah. They have no direct evidence. For that. Of course. So ever. That's fine. Exactly. This is, I'm, I'm sorry to be a bit tough on that. Mm -hmm. this, we are looking at this in the right perspective. Mm -hmm. just to broadly the thing here, this is really when you teach virtual truth, that's why I made that point. For every word, for every sentence, uh, for every episode in the meal, there are alternatives. And we have to start thinking in these terms. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an, and, the, and then extend it to the actual, to the creation, to the actual choice of the topic of the meal itself. Uh, this is not sure, Augustus and Catholics or whatever. Again, you know, Peter White in his book just deals very, very nicely with these so called commands and you know how they should be understood and all this. But I mean here we are. Uh, you say we need we need home of yeah, I mean that was an unprecedented undertaking. Uh, yeah, this is clear from Proportions too. Fine, you have Apollonius of Wilds, that's four books, a little bit longer than the Homeric books, but you know, that's that basically. Mm -hmm. There hadn't been any Homer at all. And uh, clearly, again, the, the, the uh, literary testimonium that we have that weighs very heavily here is the, is the preface to the third Georgian, where he is in fairly elusive terms, kind of metaphorical terms. He's talking about the creation of a big poem in medio mihi kaisa erit ten punkvit ten evit and this kind of thing, but it's clearly it is framed more in terms of the, almost the, the exploits of Augustus. Mm -hmm. And then you can, back to the Trojan myth, it's like what that is and others, it just, just slot it in, you know, that, that one. So I, I mean, could you could, could, could quick summary of that in, in Russian here? So here we just, you know, people, people will say, yeah, this is really, this was expected of him. To, me, to my mind, this is, we're looking at this in retrospect and say, yeah, sure, this is all very wonderful, but uh, that's what he decided to do. But it was really on his own. Mm -hmm. And that's why you get the whole stories too. I mean, there's, there's so many aspects to this mm -hmm. of, of the of the whole lot. Uh, I think it's mostly anecdotal, but I mean that's what the ancient detail are full of. That he was not satisfied with the results and that he wanted to have it burned mm -hmm. yeah, and all those kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And of course all of it says I'm going to do the same as mine after they make a copy, you know, to <laughs> say. Uh, could you just uh, summarize very quickly uh, uh, just about the stuff? Uh, 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 подвига Фагуста. Профессор Каринский не согласен. Он считает, что это правда, если мы смотрим ретроспективно, поскольку непонятно, кто те мы, которые этого хотели. Да, действительно, создание Инеиды это величайшее предприятие, если мы сравним ни с чем, но, тем не менее, читая это Библия, мы каждый раз, любая, любая строчка, любой эпизод имеет альтернативные варианты, и по мнению профессора Калининского, идея этой самой альтернативности должна быть э, расширена и на, вообще на замысел э, э, самой Инеиды. Более того, если у нас нет прямых свидетельств того, что именно э, Инеида, как она есть с ее сюжетом, была как бы, изначально заложена в заказе, условно говоря, и в действительности, если судить по тому, что достаточно метафорически Вергилий говорит Георгий, он действительно думал о большой поэме, скорее посвящающей о подвигах августа. Ну и, соответственно, к этому же относятся всякие анекдоты, которые, конечно, могут быть неправды, но тем не менее говорят о некоторой традиции. Это анекдоты о том, что Вергилий был недоволен своим созданием, что собирался его сжечь, чему потом следует родители, говорят, что тоже хочет сжечь, но сделать сначала только. 
No, thank you again, Rudy, because it's, it's, it's very useful for everybody to see two scholars don't have to agree. Yeah, that's right. No, I mean, these interchange, I mean, they're, they're really, they're, they're arguments on both sides, definitely. And I think that's, that's basically what we are doing. We are not trying to come up with that. That is what sometimes my objection to with the interpretation of Augustine poetry as, you know, just uh, political propaganda or whatever. It's too, too neat, no, no, it's, it's not methodology, it's too neat and tidy. And people always like to tidy things up. Okay. It, it, it doesn't work that way. I think we benefit far more from looking at this as a work in progress. Our own, you know, our own opinions, our own arguments included in this. And I think we learn a lot more about that uh, than, than just assuming everything is coming to life. Come on, we'll, 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 <laughs> you're doing incidentally, you're doing very well time wise, so, so don't worry. I started at about 15. I finished half an hour later. And we have time for discussion, so let's go. Right. Um, I actually want to thank you for an excellent paper. Thank you. Uh, translation. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, and I actually um, I like very much your idea of that. Uh, that that's, uh, many things that uh, we often treat as propaganda were actually uh, done not because people were told to do this. I think it's a very uh, useful idea of uh, the Icast nation. But uh, what I want to ask is, uh, when you speak of this national discussion, yeah. Uh, how do you imagine it? And in particular, how do you imagine that uh, it was uniform uniform and scale? Because it's easy to imagine that uh, people discuss it on every corner and every house. What what happens to them? Who is the guest? What is his role? But on the other hand, uh, the particular details like uh, the titles, like principles, the guest is what discussed with the same scale. Yeah, yeah, I can translate uh, <coughs> right. Uh, right. Вопрос, а вот этой дискуссии национального масштаба, какие формы и объемы она имела, и всегда я была. Here is here is how I come to that. Today, as you know, this is one of the basic um, given handicaps uh, of our profession. We rely on the resources. You know what's happened? There, that's uh, uh, what, what has been preserved. But well, guess what? People talk too at that time. They don't only write. Uh, they have conversations. Uh, they, a lot of it is lost to us. And it can be parallel too. I mean, it, it's 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 really long. Everybody who works in our field knows that. Uh, take the uh, you know the greatest honor that can happen to all is the triumph. Uh, one of the components is all these big canvases that they make, you know, just the, the pictures and all kinds of all lost to us today because it's organic material. This is among other things that like, politically and provocative on that. That's why people hang on to every coin. Oh my god, it must convey some great meaning to the populace. Uh, but I usually go in my classes that's in the US and say, okay. Uh, uh, how much land is on the one dollar bill? Nobody has any idea. <laughs> uh, when they discover 3,000 years from our dig is out, they will say the US was a bilingual nation. Uh, there was English and Latin that was being spoken. And what is worse, we entered the Pashes on these things. So, you know what? Uh, nobody pays much attention to this, really. Uh, my, my serious point is yeah, we, we try to, so far as we can see, uh, uh, we have to assume. Very clearly that people converse. Uh, that there are certain topics out there. And I'm not trying to say every street corner. Here's again another big I mean it relates to so many methodological issues we have in our field. And that's what keeps it so interesting. Uh, in the recent years, and you may have noticed that, especially in, in our archaeology and so on and so forth, a lot more emphasis on we say that so politely. I like that from the non-elite classes. Say the elites and then the non-elites. But here we are looking more and more at everyday people and all that, and others. Their, uh, their literature, no, we don't have, we have inscriptions or whatever that tell us quite a bit, but uh, this topic. Uh, so I would simply say, as, as time goes on, take this thing about Patea Akhle Prinkeps. This is in Horace 1 2. Uh, this is before the Senate meeting in 27. Uh, when the, the Prinkeps, that's a gradual process too. 
Pater Patriae is not till 2 BC. I mean, these terms are simply circulating and people are talking and, and uh, everybody is weighing in. As I said, one of the best examples of this that we can trace is clearly after 100 years of civil wars. Well, let's just uh, look at this now in time. People were really seriously saying, what is wrong? What has gone wrong here? Where did we go off the path? And how are we going to straighten this out again? And that is kind of one of the, as you can see, one of the examples that you have. Everybody has a lot of different opinions, so it really started. When in doubt, there's an original sin, you know, that we are not responsible for that. You know, somebody else did this a long time ago. And uh, others have different opinions. Clearly, there is a lot of discussion going on. That's, that's what I would say. But we see is only the literary uh, fortifications hmm? or you know, reflections of it. But I mean, most of the, most of the ancient world is oral. Hmm? You know? uh, but about literacy in the Roman world, I don't want to even get into that. You know? They figure out the percentages here, but it's very, very low, you know, obviously. Hmm? That's, you know, again, there's no certainty. I can't say here. These people participated, the others did not. But clearly, I think it can be assumed, given the range of topics and given the range of reactions, you know, there is not a, a great deal of uniformity. People come up with their own solutions. Say, what went wrong? You know, why, is the, why are we suffering all this? There's a whole catalog of reasons proposed by different people. But clearly, uh, it's not just Augustus sitting up in the hour time and saying, well, we all have to, we have to blame Anthony for this or whoever. No, it doesn't, it doesn't work. I think there was, uh, mm -hmm. there was another question mm -hmm. from you. Yeah. 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 Okay, I mean, we have, we have a little bit of time, right? Mm -hmm. Well, a few minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 При том, что э, грамотность в это время это точно не э, установлена, но во всяком случае это очевидным образом э, некоторое меньшинство э, населения. Э, археология, которые, археологические данные, которыми сейчас занимаются в Риме э, профессор Галинский, э, говорят нам о том, что Рим был населен не только элитой, но и другими слоями, и с э, его точки зрения само разнообразие, э, та многослойность, с которой мы сталкиваемся в Инаиде, э, он проецирует ее на э, общественную жизнь, на то, что люди не только писали, но и разговаривали, и спорили, и э, э, приходит к мысли, что э, нельзя исключить возможность национальной дискуссии, хотя, конечно, она происходила не совсем в тех формах, в которых она происходит в современном мире с средствами массовой информации и так далее. Ну, собственно говоря, по-видимому, речь идет о такой очевидной проекции на общественную жизнь, а затем обнаружение этой проекции из литературных источников снова литературные источники. Я, кажется, немножко добавила на интерпретации. Нет? Хорошо. Short question. I like very much your point about what if uh, Augustus would write all these yeah, works, uh, yeah, of, uh, yeah, Virgil, yeah, yeah, Paris, and yeah. so on. Yeah. But we have Res Geste. How should we look at that? Is it Res Geste? Is it a kind question. of uh, realistic uh, perspective of his life, or its ideal picture, or something else? I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Nicola, Nicola, I'm teasing all the time. That's 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 for extra money, you know. I don't care. I'm kidding here. That's, that's not part of this topic. No, uh, no but what's interesting is that uh, it, it can be considered a piece of literature. Mm -hmm. I mean, just among other things, the, the, the composition of it is, is very careful, uh, and uh, just in terms of allusion and kind of implications or whatever, he's an absolute mess. I mean, just take the very beginning of the way guest line. Uh, there is so much is left unsaid that we need to fill in. I mean. Anos unde beginti natus. Okay. Why are you thinking about that at that point? Uh, 
Alexander, Scipio, you know, like that kind of thing. Uh, and he is normally, if this was a, let's say, a standard document, you would say in the consulship of such and such. Well, guess who was consul at that time? Mark Antony. You're not going to begin to raise guest titles in reference to Mark Antony. Mm -hmm. Definitely not. But he drops out entirely. So I'm not entirely sure, I mean, but what do I make of that? He certainly, he does put his own view forward. I mean, they're the two main basic themes. These are, and again, I think that's that was, that was ignored till about, I would say, when was that, 1970s, let's see, it was a book by Colin Wells on the, uh, on the German policy of Augustus. You had this whole notion of the Pax Augusta, of the Golden Age, and uh, he was the biggest talker in Roman history for his time. And that is what, what the race guest is about. These are the wars that I fought. And today we say, well, the scholars have kind of just kind of navigated around and said, well, these were really wars of consolidation. Now, I don't think it made any difference to the people at the receiving end, whether there's a war of aggression or consolidation, it's just the same. But he said, this is, I am really the big builder of the Imperial Roman model. I'm, I'm, I'm continuing the Republican tradition. And at the same time, what is the result of this? All the in pain side, all the things that I'm doing, you know, people. So that's ultimately, I think, one of the best articles I've read on this recently is, I think it's by other officials, I think it's A.J. Bosworth, who relates us to uh, theories of new humorism. This is simply in a way he is making the case for his own deification. Mm -hmm. Right there, for his own to me, to me, to me that makes more sense. Right как может быть вы или вы или мне? Мне кажется, да, это я. Кратко суммирую, вопрос касался, какое место вот в этой картине опять можно отвести разъезды, и как профессор Галинский ответил, пошутив вначале, что про разъезды за отдельные деньги, профессор Галинский тем не менее пришел к описанию этого, и кратко говоря, его идея заключается в том, что, с одной стороны, конечно, разъезды надо рассматривать как во многом литературное произведение, поскольку э, в нем очень искусно, э, особенно в предисловии, много и не говорить, мы должны домысливать. Что же касается самой идеи, то, конечно, вот эта идея августого мира э, и золотого века здесь присутствует, присутствует в, э, при том, что описываются вообще события, связанные с, с огромными завоеваниями, аналогов, которые в истории Рима не было. Э, ученые сейчас э, говорят о том, что эти войны были консолидирующими, по мнению профессора Горинского, никакой разницы для покоренных народов консолидировали их или э, с ними делали что-то другое, не было. Э, тем не менее, одна из э, концепций, которая кажется ему достаточно интересной, это концепция Босфорта, э, которая заключается в том, что э, здесь есть э, большое, как бы, большой элемент эргемеризма, а в известной мере под, подготавливает свое обожествление. I don't know whether I'm agreeing with you or disagreeing if, with you. No, because, so, so my question is, one doesn't need a central ideologue to have an ideology, right? Okay. Um, ideology. Okay, well, I think in the way that ideology would normally be used in academic discourse these days, it means kind of the sea of beliefs um, in which we swim. Um, and in the same way that one would not any longer have to believe that Pericles is guiding all the decisions and all the dramas made in late fifth century Athens, to believe that there is an Athenian ideology that's worth talking about um, it's not clear to me where you are splitting this because you seem to be, and I think rightly, throwing out this idea that um, Augustus is like uh, uh, the, the, the great leader in, in North Korea, right? And telling everyone to say. But I don't think that that requires ruling out the idea um, that there is a dominant way of talking about things that's, of course, negotiated and renegotiated, that has fissures in it. Um, and I suppose in part I'm asking you to just respond and say, do you, do you agree with that or are you pushing does, against that? You, know, I mean, you, you read my mind perfectly on that one because even take your, take your starting definition. 
here we are yeah, in academia, and sometimes they're over there just all a bunch of lectures, and, and they, they don't uh, you know, love pointing out. I like your metaphor, how we're swimming in this kind of thing. It's, it's a wide ocean out there, you know, definitely. We're under London today, and that's only in, in the kind of in the recent years, that when you like, take American electoral politics or whatever, they say, that person is an ideologue. That's where the negative connotations come in. Mm. See right there, there's somebody who's inflexible, unbending, I possess the truth, nobody else does, etc., etc. That is the wrong definition, but that's the kind of, to, to some extent, that's what most people today will associate with that, and not the more liberal, open minded, you know, flexible kind of thing. Yeah, but I. Okay, but you know, maybe Nick Lyon was just. I was just going to just make a for fun, real quick. No, no, no. But the argument about ideology would not be that it's simply an amorphous sea in which one swims. Yeah. It is that there are waves and no, movements no, of it, there, and there are directions in it. Right? Waves of looking at those, and at the same time, I think in that sense, as I said, it depends how you define them. Absolutely, because it is a very quickly the idea of that's not ideology, it's a four virtues. Mm -hmm. Down the field. Okay. If you go to that, here's your last ideology. That is actually set up by the Senate. They say, this is how you should rule on the basis of Pietas and Virtus and Clementia and Justitia. Right? That's the ideology. Today, it's, uh, that's why I'm shying away in the, in the publications or the, from using that term. People will define it a lot more tightly. Mm -hmm. Not in the kind of, uh, you know, just general set of beliefs like right? you and I. Mm -hmm. But I'm not talking about the trouble entirely. Uh, the, the, the word the spor между профессором Олсеном и профессором Даминским касается того, что такое идеология. Поскольку сам такой спор тоже идеологичен, я не буду повторять все так, этапы этих различий, но для профессора Даминского важен тот контекст этого слова, который сейчас в Соединенных Штатах выходит на поверхность, то есть достаточно узкая, обязывающая, ведущая в некотором направлении комплекс представлений, в то время как профессор Олсен говорит, что идеология – это разнообразные видения, и все люди обладают тем или иным комплексом представлений, поэтому нельзя навязать так сказать, свою идеологию другим. И, и, Профессор Олсон просто говорит о том, что для того, чтобы что отрицая идею августа как северокорейского лидера, навязывающего всю идеологию в стране, нельзя тем не менее сбрасывать что вообще понятие идеологии, которое возникает внутри общества, существует и существует доминирующая тенденция в этой идеологии. Его можно представить как море, но не как море аморфное, но в котором есть свои волны и течения, которые движутся. Мы должны перейти. Спасибо большое.